Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Let's do it again. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hey, so good to have you here tonight to celebrate the birth of our Savior. My name's David. I'm on staff here at Frontline. If you noticed when you walked in, there's a card sitting on your seat, and punched through that card is a light bulb. You're going to need that light bulb later in today's service. But the light bulb's cool because in 1879, Thomas Edison actually patented his invention or perfection of the light bulb. The light bulb actually changed the room in an instant. As soon as he perfected it, as soon as he figured it out and power entered into the bulb, light shone out of the bulb and darkness around it was eradicated. It changed the room in an instant, but it also changed our world. In an instant, all of a sudden, we had the ability at the flip of a switch to turn on light and eradicate darkness. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 1. It says, God created the heavens and the earth, and darkness hovered over the face of the earth. And then God spoke, and he created light, and the darkness was eradicated. It changed the earth in an instant. This light is powerful. The light that God created is powerful. I mean, it moves so fast. It moves 180,000 miles per second. That's fast enough to circle the earth seven and a half times every single second. Light is so powerful. We build our lives around it. We build our calendars around it, our schedules, our time. We know seasons by it. I mean, everything we do is based off and built off of this thing called light. It is so powerful. What if there was a light that was more powerful than that? What if there was a light that couldn't just eradicate physical darkness? What if there was a light that could eradicate spiritual darkness, that could change things in an instant? What if there was a light that could set people free from bondage? What if there was a light that could loose strongholds? What if there was a light that could change everything, the spiritual darkness that hovers? What if that light could change everything? What if that what was a who? John 1 verse 4 says, in him was life, that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness is not overcome it. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone who's coming into the world. He came into the world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the world became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness.
Merry Christmas, everybody. Let's go ahead and stand and let's worship together our King. A joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare you and heaven and nature sing. Christmas to all of you. We're just thrilled that you are here. If you're newer to Frontline or this is your first time here, uh, we hope this service is a gift to you. As we gather tonight, I want to challenge you to just step fully into this service. Sing and worship with us if you feel comfortable. As you hear the message later, listen for God's voice of what he may be speaking to you. But at the same time, we also want to remember to have some fun. So is that all right if we have some fun? 
All right, so before we begin, I think we should turn to our neighbor and ask them this. Finish this sentence. It's not Christmas without blank. What is that for you? Let's find out. Let's sing this. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky look down. so good to have fun with you tonight as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. Like we just sang, makes me want to shout joy to the world. That's what this season is about. But Christmas is not only about the fun 
and the cookies and the presents and having them all wrapped or not wrapped. I don't know, some of you parents out there, you're busy. But this season is about Christ coming down to the earth to save us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into his kingdom of light. And it's a holiday because it's a holy day. In this season, we celebrate Jesus, our Emmanuel, our God with us. And it's not just another day, it's not a fantasy, but it's the reality that God loved us so much that he came to earth for us. So let's sing this together, the first Noel. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay. sing this out as one body so let your name so let your name
know, Christmas is special because it's fun and exciting and things are lit up, holiday music is playing. A lot of us, like we look forward to the season, but what we also know is the season often feels like there's a lot of darkness that comes with it too. It's people that aren't here anymore or marriages that aren't together anymore, families that don't gather together anymore. That Christmas, just as much as it's awesome, can also be awful. Our second son was just born two days ago. And this Christmas season has been so different. It's been so different because the song we just sang, the, the phrase Carol Ann used is, it's a holiday because it's a holy day. The birth of our Savior was a pause. It was a rest. In a world of chaos and darkness and unrest, it was a so let's just pause right now and go to our Heavenly Father in preparation for what He has for us tonight. God, we come before you right now, setting aside the busyness, setting aside the brokenness, setting aside things we have to think through or still accomplish or where we're going tonight. Father, I just pray that we, we would rest in this holy moment and remember the holy moment of your son's birth the light of the world. Meet us today. Speak to us today. Lead us today through your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts to receive what you have for us. We love you. We're grateful for you. We just pray that you would move in a powerful way among us today. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said together, amen. Well, hey, go ahead and have a seat. Again, my name is David. I'm on staff here at Frontline, and it's just good to, good to be with you, good to celebrate Christmas together today. I have two quick things just to share with you. Uh, one is, if you'd like to join us this coming Sunday, uh, we'd love to invite you to join us, but we actually won't be here in person. So this coming Sunday, because it's so soon and we know a lot of people are traveling, we really wanted to have an online-only service to bring not just all of you together, but actually to make it accessible to everybody at all of four of the Zero Collective churches here in Grand Rapids. So we're going to do one shared service together, and it is going to be a powerful time of worship and prayer and preaching. I mean, it's the message that we have uh, that I really believe God has put on the heart of Brian and just uh, the team, it's going to be powerful. So uh, maybe you've watched Church Online before, maybe you haven't. Frontlinegr.com slash live is where you can access that link. Um, wherever, you are, wherever you are and whoever you're with, um, it's just going to be a really special moment. So I want to invite you to do that. The other one is this. We're going to move into a time of offering right now. And uh, there's a couple different ways to give. It's on the screen behind me. But what I love about this offering particularly is over Christmas time, um, what we do for these two services yesterday and today is all of the money or all of the donations received actually don't stay here at Frontline. They all go out. So we have something called the One Initiative. So this is going to Hand to Hand, a program that feeds kids on the weekend uh, who don't have enough food. It's going to homelessness here in Grand Rapids. Uh, it's going to ministries in Haiti and Ethiopia, all over the world, and a variety of other ministries both locally and globally. So if you feel moved or if you feel led to donate, um, just know 100% of whatever you give tonight is going out of this place to people who really need it right now. So um, just let me pray for us. I know we just prayed, but let me pray for us one more time. Uh, just ask God to bless that offering and then uh, just prepare our hearts to receive what Brian has for us today. So uh, go ahead and bow your heads with me. Father, we just come before you and uh, Father, we pray for those uh, that aren't in this room right now. We pray for those who uh, are hurting in the season. We pray for those who have need in this season. We pray for those um, who are struggling, who, who don't know you. God, open our hearts just to hear from you. Some of us haven't heard from you in a long time. Others uh, haven't heard from you ever. I pray that today would be a powerful moment, God, a, a pause from the darkness, a pause from the chaos. I pray that you would speak and move in a way that we could look back and remember specifically this Christmas forever. God, we love you. We love being your people. And we just pray all of this in your son's precious and powerful and holy name, Jesus. And everybody said together, amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thanks, David. And we are so excited for you and Shannon with the birth of Jordan. That's just an amazing thing. So uh, we celebrate with you. Well, uh, welcome everyone to Christmas services here at Frontline 2021. If you're watching with us online, it's great to have you joining in with us as well. And so from my family to your family, I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Uh, this is kind of a special year, a special Christmas for my family and I, because this year, this Christmas marks 20 Christmases that we have been at Frontline, that we've been able to celebrate Christmas with all of you and our Frontline family. Um, so that's just an awesome thing. Yeah. That's really meaningful for us. And in fact, this is uh, what my family looks like now. Um, so this is my wife, Carrie, uh, my beautiful wife, and our boys. This is Aaron and Alan and John and Andrew. And crazy enough, 20 years ago, 20 Christmases ago, we only had this guy. We only had Alan. He was the only one that was born. And now they're absolutely huge, and they're all in my house right now uh, over Christmas, Christmas break. In fact, if you're looking for a last-minute gift idea for me, cereal, lots and lots of cereal. I don't understand, but they just eat boxes and boxes of cereal all the time, cereal. Anybody else have teenage boys? You know what I'm talking about? Like they just constantly devour the cereal. Um, so this is a special year for us, and it just feels uh, special to be celebrating with all of you. If this is your first time uh, part of this celebration with Frontline, welcome to the family. If it's been your first time in a while or joining in with us online, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's great to have you with us. What we're doing tonight is we are wrapping up a series we've been working through where we've been talking about Christmas scandals. So we're looking at Matthew's gospel. Matthew begins his gospel story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection with a genealogy, a, a boring list of names, or so it would seem. It's this long list of, of names in Jesus' family history. And what we've been realizing is that Matthew intentionally includes some scandalous Stories, some scandalous people with scandalous stories in his family. Maybe you have some stories of scandal in your family or in your background. And so we've looked at names like Ruth and Rahab. Uh, we've looked at names like Tamar and Bathsheba. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the final two scandalous names in Jesus' genealogy, in his family history. The final two scandalous names are Mary and Joseph. And we're going to look at Mary and Joseph's story and uh, just see what it says to us about who Jesus is and what he came to do and what we're celebrating tonight. So this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is what it says about uh, Mary and Joseph. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly... So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now, a unmarried teenage pregnancy and a broken engagement would be a scandal in any century, in any time period in history, in, and in any culture. But if I could, I'd love to give you just a little bit more background on specifically what Mary and Joseph were living in. So they lived in the first century in Judea. And so Mary would have been about 14 or 15 years old, believe it or not, at the time of this story, which would have been marrying age for Jewish women at this time. Now, her engagement to Joseph would have been arranged for her by her family. She would have, she would have had no choice in the matter. So this wasn't like this romantic, loving story, you know. This is uh, an arranged marriage that would have been basically about what was best for her family and what was best for his family. And she was going to have to go along with it. Now, they lived in Nazareth. Mary lived in Nazareth. And Nazareth, at this time in the first century, was an extremely poor town. Uh, we think somewhere around 400 people lived in Nazareth. So it's this small town. Everyone knows everyone. It's very poor. Um, some estimates are that 70% of the people who lived in Nazareth were peasant farmers, which was a very poor way to make a living. But to make matters even worse... All of the people in Nazareth would have been subject to the taxes of Rome at this time, a oppressive, brutal taxation. Some scholars think like somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of people's incomes, if you're already poor, are being taken and you've got no choice in the matter. You have to do it. So Mary, I would just describe Mary as a valley person. That's what she was. In other words, Mary was a person who knew what it felt like to wrestle with darkness that was outside of her control. 
Mary and Joseph both knew what it felt like to be under the thumb of the empire, to be on the underside of power, to, and to wrestle with, with forces of darkness that were frankly just felt overwhelming and completely out of their control. And, and all I want to do tonight is I just want to kind of look at Mary specifically, and I just want our, us to see ourselves a little bit in her if we could, because um, we're a lot like Mary. Maybe, maybe you don't think you are. Maybe you don't think your situation is much like Mary. But I would tell you one of the reasons that Mary is in Matthew's gospel and one of the reasons we look at her story is because we're supposed to see ourselves a little bit in Mary. And so a couple of key ways, two key ways that we are like Mary. First of all, we all wrestle with darkness beyond our control. Every one of us in this last year has wrestled with darkness beyond our control. And the second thing is we all have a plan for our own salvation from that darkness. The first of all, we all wrestle with darkness beyond our control. Every one of us, it's different for different ones of us. Maybe for you, it was the company that laid you off this past year when the pandemic hit. Uh, maybe it was the legal system that awarded custody after the divorce. Maybe that's your darkness that feels out of your control. Maybe it's a cancer diagnosis. Uh, maybe it's the way the pandemic has affected our lives. Um, this past week, I've been talking with several just different frontline uh, families who this year they're dealing with an empty chair at their Christmas table. Maybe it's the ways in which your family has become divided over all these issues and all these things that have happened. And frankly, it just feels like uh, things have just gotten darker. Does it feel like to anyone it's gotten darker over the last couple of years? We, we feel this, don't we? We wrestle, every single one of us, it's different for each one of us, but we wrestle with darkness beyond our control. And we all have a plan for our own salvation from that darkness. What do I mean by that? What, what I mean by that is all of us have something that we're trying to fix ourselves with. We all have some way that we're trying to gain control or salvation from that darkness that, that we deal with. So maybe for you, it's work. Work more hours, get a bigger paycheck, achieve more, buy more things, and then, then that'll make me feel like I'm enough. That'll fix me. Maybe for some of us, it's beauty. Physical fitness, you know, to be a beauty that's admired by others, to work out and work out and work out and get more and more comments and likes online. And then if, I, if people say I'm beautiful, then maybe that will make me feel good about myself. That'll fix me. For some of us, it's family. That's our plan for our salvation. That's our plan for how to fix the things that feel out of our control of our lives. We have this script we play out in our heads. If I, I'll get married and then we'll have kids and that'll fix everything. And then what happens is when we can't get married or when the divorce happens or when infidelity hits and we can't have kids the way we thought or you know, when, the, when our job fires us, whatever it is, when these things break down, it causes chaos. It causes absolute just devastation in our lives because that was the thing that we were hanging our hope on. That was the thing that we were counting on to fix what was broken in our lives. What's amazing about this story is that Joseph has a plan for how to save himself, right? He has a plan for how to fix the situation he's in. What was it? He's going to break the engagement with Mary. Now, that, that sounds really harsh, right? When we hear it, it's like, man, seriously, you're just going to abandon her right in the middle of this time? But in actuality, this would have been the honorable thing to do in this culture at this time. Joseph is literally trying to fix the situation. He's trying to, uh, you know, in, in the, as most honoring a way he possibly can, in a way that doesn't bring disgrace on Mary, he's trying to break the engagement so they can both kind of move on quietly. They're in a town of 400 people. Everybody knows. Everybody's talking. And, and so this is his plan for how to fix it. But that wasn't God's plan. And, and thank God it wasn't God's plan. Because... What we see here in what happens in the next few verses we're about to read together is that God had an invitation for Joseph in the midst of this situation, in the midst of this darkness that fell completely out of his control. God had an invitation for him. And I would tell you in these next verses we're going to read that God also has an invitation for you tonight, for you and for me and for every single one of us. If you're watching online, he has an invitation for you in these words. Let's look at this together. 
It says, as he considered this, as Joseph considered breaking the engagement, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will, and let's just say this last line together, save his people from their sins. So Jesus comes as God's plan of salvation. It's not Joseph's plan of salvation. Joseph had a different plan, but, he, God, but God brings Jesus into this situation, and Jesus is God's plan for salvation for Mary and Joseph in the situation that they're in. But I would say... In a larger way, when we look at the entire story of Scripture, the entire story of, of humanity, Jesus was God's plan of salvation for it all, to bring reconciliation, to bring salvation from the entire story that the Bible tells. There's a uh, picture that has gotten a whole lot of traction online. Uh, over the last few years, it's been getting passed around again and again. How many of you have seen this picture. Uh, some of you, okay, a lot of you haven't. So uh, this was a work of art that was originally done several years ago by a nun, actually. And it was never intended to be circulated around, but it's kind of made the rounds and become, uh, a, a, you know, something that, that a lot of people have seen. And it's such a powerful image because in one image, it tells the big story of the Bible, the big story of us, of humanity. And so what you have right here on the left is you have Eve, the mother of all creation, uh, God, in the beginning, the Bible opens with God uh, creating the heavens and, and the earth, and he creates Adam and Eve to live in um, harmony with himself and with creation. And you see here, Eve is clutching this piece of fruit with a bite out of it. Because what Eve did is she basically, the way she decided she was going to fix her situation or get control over her situation is she decided she was going to take God's place. And so she takes a bite of the fruit Sin enters our world. And, you know, it says that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. So if I, if I were to give just a simple definition of sin, sin is basically any way in our lives that we seek to take God's place. It's any way in our lives that we seek to fix ourselves with something, to take God's place in our lives. And, and that's what Eve did. But notice she's got her hand on the pregnant belly of Mary. It's all, there's almost this desperation to this picture, isn't there? And if sin is any way in which we try to take God's place, salvation could be defined as God taking our place. That through Jesus, and, and Jesus came through Mary, God basically brings a perfect atoning sacrifice that Jesus willingly offered his life in our place and a sacrificial death so that we could be reunited to God. In fact, the name Jesus actually means salvation. It means God saves. Now, here's the thing about uh, this picture. A whole lot of you already know that story. Many of you in this room, many of you watching online right now, you grew up hearing that story. I can show you this picture, and you didn't even need the explanation I just gave you over the last couple minutes here. You already know what that picture means. You can see it. You even know what the snake means wrapped around her foot, but it's being crushed by her heel. You, you already know the story, but here's the thing. Just because you know the story doesn't mean anything has actually happened in your life as a result. Because a lot of us, you can know the story, you can know the information, but Jesus came to be a savior because we needed to be saved. He's, you know, you can look at him as a teacher. A lot of people talk about him. He was a great teacher. He was a great philosopher. He was a, a righteous person. He lived a, a good life, a moral life. And all those things are true. But the Bible calls Jesus a savior because we needed to be saved. It's, it's kind of like this light bulb here. You know, this light bulb, just because it has the mechanisms that can, that can shine light, Nothing actually happens with this light bulb. It has no power within itself to turn on. You can sit here and flip the switch all you want. Nothing is going to happen for this light bulb until it is connected to a power source outside of itself. And that's when the light comes on. And a whole lot of us, it's like we're walking around with this light bulb. We know the story. We know the information. We know what that picture means. We understand all the details. But, we're, but personally, experientially, we haven't experienced the person of Jesus. We haven't plugged into 
the power source outside of ourselves, which is Jesus. Jesus came to be that for our world and for us. And so what happens is nothing really changes in our lives until we personally connect to the person of Jesus Christ, until we know him personally. And so how do we do that? How do we actually take that step? How do we connect ourselves into the person of Jesus? The simplest way I know to describe it is just we, we have to come to this place where we surrender our plan of salvation so that we can accept his plan. His plan was Jesus. Whatever it is that you're trying to fix yourself with, what you, we all know what it's like to wrestle with darkness outside of our control. And every single one of us has some kind of a plan for how we're going to fix ourselves or how we're going to save ourselves from that darkness. The invitation of the gospel is to surrender your plan of salvation. The fancy word that Jesus used for that was repent. Repent. That means to turn around, to basically surrender the way that you're trying to fix yourself, the way that you're trying to save yourself, the way that you're trying to make yourself good enough from all these things that feel overwhelming in your life and so that you can actually accept his plan of salvation, so that you can accept him. That's what we're invited to do so that he can come into your life, so that he can be your Lord, so that the light bulb can come on, so that he can become the power source by which you live your life. So why don't people do that? Why do we hear that message again and again and again? And for so many of us, why don't we ever get to that point where the light bulb actually comes on? And we continue carrying around the light bulb. We know the story, but we aren't experiencing it personally in our day-to-day -day lives. Why does that happen? Here, here's why I think it happens. The reason I think we don't plug in to Jesus, why we don't invite him into our lives personally, is because we hear the gospel message. And for so many of us, we say to ourselves, well... Yeah, but you know, if I become a Christian, that means I'm going to have to forgive my sister-in-law. Well, if that were true, then the gospel message we're celebrating would be Jesus plus a forgiving heart is what equals salvation. But that's not the gospel. That's not what the message is. We, we hear it and we think, well, yeah, I'd love to become a Christian, but you know, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to stop sleeping with my girlfriend. Well, if that were true, then the gospel message would be Jesus plus sexual purity equals salvation. But that's not the gospel message, is it? The message of the gospel, the message that we're given at Christmas time and that we celebrate is Jesus plus nothing. Jesus plus nothing, that he himself is sufficient. Mary and Joseph brought nothing to the equation except their willingness to say yes to his plan. You can't clean yourself up in order to come to Jesus. Okay, that's like putting on your makeup so you can jump in the bath. The, the language for faith, the language for this that we use around here at Frontline, we've talked about many, many times over the years, is this idea that faith, the language of faith is yes before how. We say yes to Jesus. We say yes to being into, plugged into the power source of Jesus in our lives. And then we don't worry about the how. We let him do the heavy lifting. We let him become Lord of our lives. And we begin to follow him. We begin to let him clean up the things that only he can clean up. Because if we could do it on our own power, we'd be doing it. But we can't. The gospel message is Jesus plus nothing. It's a move of saying yes. And I'll entrust him with the how. Whatever that means on the other side of it. When you do that, when you come to a place where, where you actually invite Jesus, you surrender your plan of salvation, you invite Jesus to be Lord of your life, what Jesus said in, 12, in John chapter 12, verse 46, what he said about his whole mission, he said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I've come as a light to shine in this dark world. And we've noticed it's gotten darker haven't we? So that anyone who puts their trust in me, not in their own plan of salvation, not in their own way to fix themselves, they no longer have to remain in that dark. Listen to me very, very carefully. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, there is a high cost to remaining in the dark. There is a high price to pay for going into 2022 remaining in in the dark of your own plan, of your own efforts, of your own attempt to fix yourself with whatever it is. We all wrestle with darkness outside of our control. 
And all of us have a plan for our own salvation from that. What's your darkness that you've wrestled with this past year in 2021? What is it for you? I'll go first. I'll tell you what it's been for me. Uh, This past year, well, in 2015, I was diagnosed with a form of cancer of which there is no um, official cure as of right now. So I was in remission for a period of time, and then in January of 2021, earlier this year, I found out that I was no longer in remission and I was going to have to go through uh, chemotherapy. And so I entered five months of chemotherapy starting in January, and man, God has been so good to me through that. There were, uh, it was hard. There were hard times. And man, our church family has been so good. Uh, you guys have loved us. And when I say things like, uh, you know, 20 years here, 20 Christmases with you at Frontline, that is not lost on me. How, how blessed I am to be standing here with you tonight, to, to be with my family. But here's how the, that affects me the last year. Every single morning when I wake up, I'm in remission right now, and every single morning I wake up, and I would say within about 30 seconds of when I open my eyes, the thought comes into my head, how long? How long do I have in remission? It's like, a, it's like something that just sits right here on my shoulders, like something that's pursuing me all the time. It's the darkness that just feels completely out of my control. And so over this last year, uh, in my worst moments, my plan to fix that, my plan to save myself from that has been uh, to obsessively Google everything I can to learn about the disease that I have, to learn about, uh, you know, possible treatments, all these things. I've lost hours at a time. I don't even know where they went, just sitting there obsessing and worrying and having anxiety and freaking out about all the things that might happen or might not happen. Because, because here's the lie. The, the thought is, if I can just understand it, if I can just read enough, if I can just find some piece of information, then I'll be able to control it. I'll be able to fix it somehow. And... What I've discovered this past year in a richer and deeper way than I have ever known in my life, I've known it in the past, but I know it to the core of my being. The anchor for my soul, the place where I've gone to find hope, the only real comfort I've found is that at some point in that morning, after that thought pops into my head, every morning I sit down in the same chair and I open up the word of God and I just begin to ask God to speak to me, and I, and I apply the gospel message. What we've just been talking about tonight, the reason Jesus came, and when I begin to apply the gospel message to, to that darkness in my head, and I begin to apply the gospel message in prayer, what, what happens is Jesus meets me in that. I can't explain it, but he does. And, and what he reminds me, and what I can sit here and tell you tonight, is that my hope is, is not, you know, Jesus didn't come into this world to fix trials and sorrows. What the gospel tells us is Jesus came to end trials and suffers, suffering once and for all. My hope is not that he will fix my sickness. My hope is in the fact that he has ended all sickness and death once and for all, for all of eternity. And that is real hope, my friends. That is a hope that is an anchor for your soul. That is a hope that will see you through any darkness. It's true light. And so I, I, what I want to do tonight is I want to just say to you, he wants to be the light for you and your life so that you don't remain in the darkness. I'm going to put a prayer up here on the screen. Jesus wants to be the light for you. So you don't have to remain in the darkness of the addiction in 2022. He wants to be the light for you so you don't remain in the darkness of the endless need to perform so that you have value. So that you don't have to remain in the darkness of the trap of beauty 
the trap of trying to, to fix yourself with something, with, whether it be a substance, whatever it is, so that you no longer remain in the dark. That's why Jesus came. He is a savior and he really is that good. So here's what I wanna do. I just wanna um, in, invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's actually more of a confession than a prayer. Romans 10 says to us, the way we plug into the light, it says, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. The power source from the outside comes in and, and he becomes the light with, by which we live, not our own plan. So would you bow your heads with me? For some of you, this is the, maybe the first time you've ever done this. Maybe you've known the story. You've heard the story before. But this is the first time you're ever actually saying now, for me personally. For other, others of you, maybe you did this at one time in your life, but then you turned away, you walked away. And so what you're saying tonight is, Jesus, I'm coming back home. I'm coming back to you, the true light. I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. So would you pray this with me, if, this, if that's you tonight? Jesus, I put my trust in you, the true light, that I may no longer remain in darkness. I confess you as Lord and light of my life. I ask you to forgive me and give me life abundantly in you. And in Jesus' name, we all said, amen. My friends, if you just prayed that prayer and if you truly meant it, whether you're watching online or whether you're here listening to the sound of my voice right here in this room, if, if you did that and you truly meant it, what we believe is that you just got saved. You just plugged into the power source for all of eternity for your life to the true hope that is real hope that our world can't offer. And so we are the church and it's Christmas and we celebrate things like that. We celebrate when people go from darkness to light. And so uh, we're gonna do something symbolic uh, right now in the room to celebrate that decision, to celebrate people going from darkness to light. And so if you just prayed that prayer, I'd love for you to grab this card. Um, it's right there. There's a little bit of light bulb that's in there. That's uh, for everybody, you can pop that out and take it home. It's just a way of remembering this service. But if you prayed that prayer tonight, if, if you trusted Jesus with your life, I'd love for you, even as I'm talking right now, grab a pen. They're all in the seats. And just give us, fill out your name, and then just give us either your email or your phone number. And then whether or not this was a first-time commitment for you or whether this was a recommitment, the first time doing this or, or a coming back home to do this. And then here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and we're going to sing a couple of songs together. And what I want you to do is when you've got that card filled out, I want you to make your way into the aisles. And you'll notice in the aisles, there are these strands of light and there are these white boxes. They look like Christmas presents over here in all the different aisles. And so what I want you to do is um, as we're singing, I want you to come and drop this card in the box. And then what I want you to do is uh, turn one of the light bulbs on the strand so it'll come on. Uh, screw, righty tighty, okay, everybody? instructions. And when that light bulb comes on, that's a symbolic way of saying your life, you're not just carrying around a dead light bulb anymore. The light of Jesus Christ has entered your life now and for all of eternity, and you are living by that light now. And so we're going to light this place up in the room and celebrate new life in Christ. That's what we're going to do. So will you stand? Stand to your feet right now. If you prayed that prayer, if you did that, fill out that card right now and begin, even as we're singing right now, begin making your way into the aisle and uh, let's celebrate, let's do this. Jesus redeems people. He brings us from darkness to light.
story of redemption it started in a manger
your life in this place. Praise God. Man, we've seen so many people over the last two nights take this step, and we, we celebrate with you. This is a, a starting line moment of your life. It's not a finish line moment. God is going to do more and more and more. As you say yes before how, he's going to help you. He's going to keep walking with you, and we're wanting to be uh, here to help you as well. If you're online, we're celebrating with you as well. If you made that decision, we celebrated you in this room as well. And so um, I want to leave you with just a, a couple things here. If you, if you um, actually turned a light bulb, if you um, filled out that card and did that, we would love to actually give you a gift um, tonight. Call it a, an early Christmas present. Uh, but over here on this corner of the room, Nick, can you just kind of wave your arms up in the air? So like, Nick's right over there. Uh, we've got a gift. Please make your way over to that table and grab that on your way out. Uh, and then I wanted to let you know, we, I think we already mentioned the 26th is going to be an online-only uh, virtual service. But then on January 2nd, the following Sunday, we're going to start a brand new teaching series. I would love to invite all of you to come back either online or in person and be with us at uh, 9.30 and 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings as we start this new teaching series, Pursue, talking about the God who pursues us. Just take a, a, a minute and just watch this quick video clip of that series and what it's going to be about. With that being said, I hope you'll join us on January 2nd as we start that. If, you're, uh, if you took that step and made that decision tonight, please don't forget your gift. Love you guys. Seriously, it's just such a joy and a privilege to be your pastor and to be with you even on these moments together. So Merry Christmas, everybody. Have a great night. We'll see you in the new year.